Obama sought to downgrade the U.S. as a relationship. It, that was a special relationship. It was unlike any other bilateral relationship which the United States had. I think the really big breaking point was the secret negotiations with the Iranians, because that's not about allies. That was betrayal. We have to restore those security zones. It's a matter of national survival. It's not even a matter of volition. And yes, the world is going to condemn us. And yes, there's going to be extreme tensions and maybe even breakdown in relations with uh, the United States. But at the end of the day, we have no choice, Matt. And if we have to throw rocks at these people, we will. This is a Visegrad 24 series about the Israel-Hamas war. Today we are here with Ambassador Michael Oren as we continue our podcast series, the Visit Grad 24 interviews in Israel. It is great to be with the former ambassador of Israel to the United States, who happens to be from the United States, which that in and of itself is an interesting story that we will discuss, among other things. In fact, let's lead off with that. Go go. Tell us Hi, Matt. Bit. Good to be with you. Great Good to be with Visegrad. People, I think, here know your story really well. In the West, unless you're a very big Israel watcher, they don't know the details of your story being involved in geopolitics. Give us a little bit of background. Um, came from a small town, uh, northern New Jersey, um, working class neighborhood, only Jewish kid in the neighborhood. Um, and my neighbors never stopped reminding me of that, <laughs> usually with their fists uh, every day. Um, and my father, uh, World War II veteran, landed on Normandy, went fought to the whole war. Uh, he and his brother um, were liber liberated a concentration camp, and um, they took photos of what they saw there. I actually carry those photos still on my, uh, my cell phone today. And every time I'd come home all bloody and having been called a, a Christ killer, my father would open the album of these pictures and show me the piles of bodies and the crematoria. And would say, you see that, son? You see that? That's why we need a strong state of Israel. Uh, if you've got a bloody nose, you're nine years old, that has a big, big impact on you. I grew up in the period of the, the Six-Day War. You know, we all remember the big victory, dancing at the, the Western Wall. That's not what I remember. I remember the three weeks before the Six-Day War, where um, Israel was surrounded by Arab armies. No one was going to do anything. The United States wasn't going to do anything. And we thought we would witness uh, there would be a second Holocaust in one generation. And the sense that, okay, the Jews have to rely uh, on ourselves, only on ourselves. And I just, from the earliest days, just wanted to live here. So right your first visit here? I lived when I was 15 and uh, alone back then when Israel was the Wild West back then. There was nothing, there was nothing here. <laughs> nothing. There was the, there were no restaurants. Uh, even the falafel was bad. Um, and, and the worst thing was with no central heating. There was no heating. You had to heat up your water with kerosene and, um, and certainly no Cheerios and no toilet paper uh, that you'd want to use. And um, it, when I was 15, I also uh, joined a Zionist uh, youth movement. We went to Washington, D.C., and I had the great privilege of meeting Israel's ambassador to the United States back then. I shook his hand. But at that moment, I said, that's what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be Israel's ambassador to the United States. And his name was Yitzhak Rabin. I later became prime minister. I later became an advisor to Yitzhak Rabin. I was advisor uh, up to the, you know, of course, the day of his assassination in 1995. Uh, so it was always a, a great dream that I would move to Israel uh, and be that ambassador. But that's, you know, the short version because it meant, first of all, uh, working on various kibbutzim, the farms, uh, being in the army as a lone soldier, as a soldier without a family here, and the paratroopers fighting in a few wars, uh, raising a family here, having kids who became soldiers and fought in wars. Uh, and then coming back from Washington uh, and running for office and being in Knesset uh, for four years and being the deputy to the prime minister. When did you become the ambassador? And in 2009. And if and, I recall, you know, actually, because of the State Department rules, you had to renounce your U.S. citizenship. Yeah, I did. Because you well, have very painful. You don't want to do this. Believe me. Yeah. Then you go into the American embassy and they stand in front of an American flag. You raise your hand and they read you all your renunciation of rights, the rights you're no longer to have anymore. And they take a big stainless steel puncher and they punch a hole in your passport right to the heart of that American eagle. <laughs> oh boy, I cried. And I know the guys at the embassy, so they're all hugging me. It was good. But it's, uh, it's painful. Listen, they can take away my passport. They're not going to make me less American, less of a football nut, you know, uh, less of a, a civil war nut. I'm a crazy civil war nut. I'm the only American ambassador that went to all the reenactments. <laughs> it was the 150th anniversary when I was there. Um, I was not a political appointee. I was what's called a professional appointee. I was not a member of the Likud, um, and, but I was an author of books about the Middle East, about America in the Middle East, about Israel's history. 
uh, and have become sort of very active both in the American media and in the American Congress and in the White House as someone who would brief and be an analyst. I would already been an analyst for CBS. Uh, I would later be an analyst for CNN as well. So that uh, maybe I, I think uh, the prime minister said that that'd be a good choice to meet the new administration of Barack Obama, which uh, uh, promised to be very challenging and more than lived up to that promise. Sure. As somebody who had American roots, understood American politics as well as you did as ambassador and continue to, what was it like dealing with the Obama administration as well as the members of the legislature, the senators and the, the House members who are on the committees? You would have a conversation with them. I've advised other you know, foreign, uh, foreign governments that I've been involved with as a friendly, tried to help them navigate it. You come in with a lot of knowledge. Did you find hostility? Did you find warmth? Did you find a mixed bag given the timing? Let's put it this way. You know, many people would say, so the critics of the Obama would say that he was anti-Israel, even anti-Semitic. He was neither. But he had a different worldview, a very different worldview uh, than Israel's worldview. It was a worldview that uh, had uh, tremendous misgivings about the use of military force, um, about a great regard for international institutions like the UN. You can imagine this. Um, and um, I think that Obama sought to downgrade the U.S.-Israel relationship. It, that was a special relationship. It was unlike any other bilateral relationship which the United States had. The United States had even with even with the, even with the United Kingdom, and um, he downgraded that one as well. He, he remember tried, returning the Churchill bust. Very, ah, very yes, early, he did. First oh, I, I don't call that that that's symbolic. I'm talking about substantive sure. downgrading, and uh, so much so that his Secretary of State Hillary Clinton um, boycotted the Israeli embassy for most of her term which is unheard of in U.S. as a relationship. Every previous ambassador had full access to the Secretary of State all the time. Um, but there are many other aspects of the downgrading. I think he sought to normalize those relationships. And that created a lot of friction, particularly on the flashpoints of the peace process with the Palestinians, and ultimately the biggest flashpoint uh, in America's relationship with Iran. And I think also the Obama administration sought to pivot. You know, we talk about the pivot to Asia. Yeah. But the pivot in the Middle East was away from America's traditional Sunni and Israeli allies uh, toward Iran. Um, and um, you were I, there when they introduced the JCPOA. I was there when they, when they began to negotiate it. Yeah. And um, though the negotiations were secret at the time, and um, and it, it was you have to understand that our closest ally was negotiating behind our back with our number one enemy, who sought to destroy us about a nuclear program that had existential ramifications for the state of Israel. So in terms of you know, an, an alliance, it was, um, it was very severe. And you know, I always proceeded on a number of assumptions. One was, first of all, I was Israel's ambassador to the people of the United States, and which meant I had to get out of Washington as often as possible, big place, that country, the United States, go to states, cities that uh, Israeli ambassadors had never been to. I was the first Israeli ambassador to go to Puerto Rico, for example. Um, because of my father's military background, I had a close relationship with the U.S. military. I visited all the academies, the war colleges, and I've been to Leavenworth, Kansas. <laughs> uh, For those who don't know, that is the uh, legendary federal penitentiary where they send people like Al Capone over the decades. It's also the war college. <laughs> it's where your generals study. Um, and, um, and that meant that uh, it wasn't just about Israel and Obama and about the Congress at that time, which but in, certainly in my time was... Um, up to 2010 was controlled by the Democrats in both houses. So um, it made for very, some very rough rides uh, going on. But it also meant reaching out to the people of the United States. Now, I had had a long experience with the media, and I um, reached inclusion early on that, um, that the way to gain influence in the United States was to be on the media as many times as possible. So there were, there were nights when I would sleep out in my car outside the studios of, of Washington, D.C., because CNN, Fox, they're all in the same place. Yeah, MSNBC. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you ran into, ran back, back, back. On Capitol, there. Northwest over there. Endless, so. endless, endless. Um, endless, endless. You were and then reaching out to different communities. You, 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 Sundays, you find yourself in church. You'd reach out to the Irish Americans and to the, even the Iranian Americans, the Muslim Americans. I was the first Israeli ambassador to institute, institute the, the Israeli iftar. So the iftar, you know, is the breakfast for Ramadan. Yeah. Uh, my security people thought it was crazy. They thought, well, you're going to put 80 Muslim leaders into the embassy? I said, yeah, we're going to put 80 Muslim leaders into the embassy. And they still do it to this day. Today, it's actually a waiting list to get into that, uh, to that event. So very, I was proud of that. Um, many ways you could reach out and be a different type of ambassador. With the, in, with the Obama administration was acknowledging, okay, that there is, there is these changes and doing my best to try to hold it all together. Um, the 
two principles that had guided U.S.'s relations for many years was the principles of no daylight, right, and, uh, and no surprises. And uh, the administration came in and basically erased those two principles. And no daylight meant that if we're going to have differences, we should have them between us behind closed doors and not let our common enemies enjoy our bickering. Every fight was publicized right up front. And then no surprises. Um, you know, in the past, if a president gave a, a speech that related to Israel's security, we got a chance to look at that speech before it was given and to give our comments. And um, there was not one time where during my term in Washington or subsequently where we were given that opportunity. Every speech surprised us, and many speeches changed longstanding American policies to our detriment. So that was a very difficult uh, challenge to, to grapple with during that period um, and come out to the public and say, you know, everything's okay, you know, good friends can disagree, allies can disagree. I think the really big breaking point was the secret negotiations with the Iranians, because that's not about allies. That was betrayal. Yeah, and creates an existential threat. In 2010, there was a pretty big inflection in the legislature, the Tea Party Revolution. You had a, a massive pickup in the House and the Senate. This was the first term of Rand Paul. Uh, that led to 2012, where Republicans also gained ground when Ted Cruz came in. And yet a lot of evangelicals coming into Congress, and these are people who have made it no secret that their spiritual and their political view is to stand very, very tightly with Israel. But you can juxtapose this with a lot of Dems who have most of the Jewish Demo Jewish high-level politicians have been of the Democratic Party. So how did you navigate that? How did you Not easy. Yeah, <laughs> no, I know. They're, they're, I don't forget my first meeting with the... Uh with the Democratic uh, members of Congress and the, the Jewish Democratic members of Congress. And I expected after a very rough time with the White House to come in and get a little bit of, of warm love. And I walked into a, a very severe ambush uh, on, on issues of settlements, issue of uh, certainly Judea and Samaria, uh, Palestinian issues. It, was, it was, wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Um, but you, know, you deal with it. These are the representatives of the American uh, Jewish community and of the American populace, population in general. Um, and, you know, you also, as, a, as the ambassador of Israel, you're also the ambassador to the American Jewish community. But the problem is there's no American Jewish community. There are many dozens, if not hundreds, of American Jewish communities. Um, and factual. Probably the hardest meeting I ever had in my term. Harder than, you know, meeting with various caucuses in, 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 uh, in Congress or meetings in the White House or meeting in the NSC or meetings in the CIA or the Pentagon. The hardest meeting I had was with the progressive rabbis of the Bay Area, which is kind of, re kind of redundant, right? <laughs> the progressive rabbis of the Bay Area. But they were, that was an interesting, interesting in encounter. Did you find that in the Republican shift in control that there was now a little bit of a check on the White House's uh, breaking down of this relationship when you talk about the surprises and the no daylight? Uh, did allies coming from these evangelical communities and these sort of big R, big C conservative Republicans, did they start to try and bring it back as much as they could? They could, but listen, under the, under the Constitution, uh, foreign policy is almost exclusively the purview of the executive. And the ability of Congress to impact uh, foreign policy and its conduct is very limited. It's pretty much limited to issues of, you know, appropriations. And we had no problem with appropriations. And we got funding for Iron Dome, and I was proud to bring the funding for Iron Dome. Uh, we began the process of acquiring the F-35 jet. Um, and really, no complaints about Congress whatsoever. I used to say, uh, you know, we have, we have the Iron Dome, but above the Iron Dome is a, is a marble dome, and the marble dome of the Capitol. And, uh, but with the administration, again, it was... Um, I must say this about the, about the Obama administration, they would always, almost always meet our, our um, financial or philanthropic expectations. So we came to them and said, listen, we need help with Iron Dome, or we need help with a, so like putting out the Carmel fire, mm -hmm. okay? That was in December 2010, it was a very dangerous fire here. Um, but on the policy level, and certainly on the diplomatic level, um, they were going to come at us and come at us very fast. How many years did you serve as ambassador? Almost five. Because you overlapped a little now into the Trump term. No, I did not. Oh, you did not. Okay. Because I, I met did you in the second term of Obama. Okay. And Because uh, I met you in D.C. during Trump's yeah. term. Yeah. No, but I was served as an advisor to the Trump peace plan. Ah, okay. Yeah, That's I remember why. Meeting you at the and uh, White House. And I was involved Monica in the early party. stages of what later became the Abraham Accords. So let's flash fast forward a little bit to Trump's term and now trying to recalibrate first on Iran, uh, obviously uh, trying to 
renege on that deal, which I think many people on the right thought was appropriate, uh, myself included, uh, and trying moving the embassy, for instance, really trying to realign in a close way, again, both spiritually and philosophically, and politically, geopolitically. Right. Um, and recognizing the sovereignty of the Golan Heights. That was a big issue for me, because in Knesset, I, I, I established the caucus for Israeli sovereignty and development of the Golan Heights. And so I was uh, in the White House more than once, um, seeking American recognition of the Golan Heights, which was, by the way, not, a, not an easy lift because America had already recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. So it meant taking another step. Um, but I view that as absolutely critical because Israeli control of the Golan Heights as sovereignty is, is key not only to our, so, uh, our security, but to the entire region's security. In Golan Heights falls, and you've got Syria going into Jordan, going into Saudi Arabia, going into the Gulf. Um, we are blocking that by being on the Golan Heights. Um, <clears throat> um, the Trump era was very, very different. Very different. Um, there weren't the type of daily crises. <clears throat> in Washington, I had not, I had not successive crises. I had revolving crises. There'd be several in a day. Uh, so it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a halcyon period uh, in U.S. Israel relations. Um, and then the withdrawal from the JCPOA in 2018, which I personally uh, welcomed very much. Uh, I think the JCPOA was a, a serious threat to Israel and to the United States and to the world. It, um, it was fall. It was it presented on numerous uh, false premises. One was that it, you know, stopped, it blocked Iran's path to the to the bomb. It, it did no such thing. It actually paved uh, Iran's path to the bomb, uh, and that there was no alternative to diplomacy other than war. And uh, and the alternative to diplomacy was harder diplomacy, which the United States under that administration was unwilling to uh, undertake. Um, the problem with his, with Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA is that uh, he lost the election. And there was no follow-up to it. And um, the Iranians understood that with the new Democratic administration, there would be the attempt to return to the JCPOA. So it's interesting that the, the major, major violations, the flagrant violations of the JCPOA, which later occurred, and that is Iran enriching uranium uh, first to 20%, then 60%, and beyond, um, only occurred after, after Joe Biden's victory in, in November 2020. That's when it happened. Before that, they didn't dare do it with Trump. And I'll tell you something else. This is not to be political. Um, I am not a prophet. I want to say unequivocally, I am not a prophet. Um, on October 5th, I was, uh, this year, I was in uh, Dallas giving a talk to some real estate people. And <clears throat> I mentioned, I predicted that Israel would soon be at war, which got everyone to sort of gasp. And, and then I explained why. I said, the, the Biden administration is now trying to broker a peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia has a nuclear component, and Iran simply will not sit quietly while the Saudis acquire a nuclear program, nuclear power. And Israel at the time was very divided over the judicial review. America was paralyzed. They couldn't even uh, elect the Speaker of the House. Um, and above all, the Iranians were afraid of the return of Trump. They were looking at the surveys, they were looking at the statistics, and they're saying, he's allowed to come back. And if he comes with Biden, we know exactly what his policy is going to be toward us. Well, with, with uh, Donald Trump, we have no idea what his policy would be, would be toward us. So if we're going to stop this peace process between Israel and Saudi Arabia, the easiest thing to do would be to start a little war. And uh, it seems to be very, very clear. Now, we haven't found the smoking gun that says that Iran started this thing, but there's a tremendous amount of circumstantial evidence. And uh, when the war broke out on October 7th, two days later, um, I was shocked, but not surprised. I think it was well understood by a lot of the uh, the thought leaders in the geopolitical analysis community that it was this normalizing of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia that certainly gave Iran means motive and opportunity and motive being the operative uh, uh, hinge point uh, that they could not abide by this because this would downgrade them to a second tier power in this region. It would confront them with the Saudi nuclear capability and prevent them with a, a joint Israel, Saudi Arabia, Saudi, Saudi both economic and strategic front. They were talking about making a rail line between Haifa and Riyadh. Yeah. That's just the Iranians are not going to sit by and let that happen. And uh, it seemed to be very, uh, very obvious that that would, uh, that would somehow explode. Of course, I didn't predict you know, the dimensions here, but I think if you go back to an article um, I wrote for The Atlantic uh, some years ago called The Coming Middle Eastern Conf Confrontation or Conflagration, um, I outlined a scenario that's very similar to what's happening right now, where a border dispute between Israel and uh, either Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, leads to a situation where Iran will come close or even past the breakout point and will involve Shiite militias in Iraq and Syria and the Houthi rebels in Yemen. That is prophetic. 
Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a. If you ask me now, what's going to happen? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of moving my, parts. My, my prophetic yeah. abilities uh, uh, ended probably about yesterday, but. Um, well, there was a little bit more of a binary construct there, and especially watching the Saudis look to build their commercial relationships post-Abraham Accords, which, by the way, we have to talk about. It's an incredible uh, victory for the whole world and Western civilization to... to but we have to maintain it, Matt. And it'll only be maintained, I tell you honestly, speaking very candidly, we'll be maintained only if we win against Hamas. Because the signatories to these agreements, you know, much as they have to gain economically, financially, um, technologically from Israel, at the end of the day, what they want is security. And they're facing dual threats. They face the threat of Sunni extremism, the form of the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, ISIS, yeah. and they face uh, Shiite extremism, Iran, Hezbollah. And there's only one country in the Middle East and the world that's standing up to both of them, and that's us. So if we want these peace to include, to continue, we need to win the war. Oh, absolutely. No, and I always say that, you know, nations that trade together don't war against one another. At least that becomes less of a priority, but you've got internal populations even in, in Saudi, which is being ruled rather tightly, uh, extremist segments. We all know that the September 11th hijackers had Saudi roots. And so, you know, trying to induce this commercial ties with the Emiratis, with the Saudis, but you have Iran on the side and Qatar on the side also trying to catalyze uh, revolution and, you know, maybe another Arab Spring, bring back uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which is being held together very precariously. So as always, it's a tinderbox, but this hinge point of defeating Hamas is, I think, the fork in the road. Where do we stand on it? How does it look from your perspective? Today is a, you know, right now we're in the midst of a, a grueling war, a very uh, expensive war, costly war in terms of our soldiers' lives, in terms of our foreign relations, uh, potentially in, in terms of our, our legal uh, standing in the world, uh, the danger of sanctions and boycotts, um, all real. Uh, I have to quote of a, a, an imminent source for you. No, no one you know. Uh, the source is my barber, <laughs> um, who was cutting my hair and said, uh, you know, the worst thing about this war, beside all the, the death, the hostages, the suffering, is the loneliness, is the feeling that we are alone in the world. And I, I, I've heard this from many Israelis, but not articulated as, as succinctly as my barber put it, but I think he put his finger on it very much. You know, we feel very lonely. Um, not only does nobody understand us, or a few people understand us, but they're, they're, they're so egregiously hostile that they even deny uh, the events of October 7th, or they actually blame us for them, or they, they accuse us of actually perpetrating them or fabricating them on, with AI. Um, it's maddening. And um, the total explosion of anti-Semitism uh, globally, I spend a lot of time going back to the to United States meeting with Jewish communities, and I have seen Jewish communities that I've never seen in that state before. Uh, many decades of working with them, uh, what they see in the audience is confusion, but above all, fear. With candor, that is why we are here. This is why we came to Israel by way of background. Visegrad started in Central Europe, about Central Europe, intermarrying countries, covering with an English language, sovereignty bent, and we saw it in October, this is ground zero for the fight for Western civilization. Absolutely. Classical liberal values and all of humanity. Absolutely. And if you watch the video, which I'm sure you have and some of us have, of what Hamas did on October 7th, that is devoid of humanity. And so this is the, the place where we're fighting. I put a finer battle. point on it. I have a, I have a sub stack called Clarity. And um, it was one uh, piece I published some weeks ago called, what are we talking about when we talk about Israel-Palestine? And the protesters who say Palestine uh, maybe they have some idea where Palestine is. They have no idea of Palestinian history. They have no idea of geography. They have no dear, you know, Palestinian culture. They probably couldn't main any, name any Palestinian cultural figure. It doesn't matter. Palestine is synonymous with a whole list of issues. If you are pro-Palestine, you're probably socialist or a communist. You probably don't like American Western civilization. You are in favor, this is quite ironic, uh, of you know, gender equality was something that's the last thing you're going to get in Palestinian so society. LGBT rights, the last thing you're going to get in, uh, in Palestinian society. Women's rights. Um, you so are, you don't take queers for Palestine seriously. You no, know, you are an internationalist. You are a pacifist. Uh, there's all these understandings. When you say the word Palestine, this is what you mean. By contrast, we say Israel. You mean pride in your country. You mean pride in family values. You mean pride in, uh, in traditions. Um, you mean a whole set of synonyms when you say Israel and Palestine. So what you have going on here is not just a clash between Israel 
and the Palestinians or Israel and Hamas, you have a truly a, a culture conf, a great clash of cultures. And um, I think it really came at, at forward in that uh, in the congressional inquiry uh, uh, of the presidents of, of leading Harvard. universities, Harvard, MIT, and, and yeah. University of Pennsylvania, because ostensibly this was about Israel and anti-Semitism on campus, but what it was really about was about America and the future of America, the soul of America, if you will. Sure. I mean, it exposed, and by the way, you know, many of us have talked for ages about the, the woke revolution, the, the, the progressive radicalism that is a redux of the 60s, but evolved in a new format in the mm -hmm. universities. They were taken over in the 60s. Now, those who took those universities over are running the universities and the institutions and the cultural Marxism. You're exactly right that, you know, the Palestinian cause has been a Marxist cause. I mean, if you look at the, the 70s and the 80s, uh, when the Soviet Union was still around, they were helping fund it. They were helping push it into the Western press as something to align with, if you believe in workers of the world unite. But where does that leave us with the universities? I mean, these are the paragons of free discourse and high-level thinking in our well, societies. Well, if you look at my resume, you'll see that I've been at a lot of these universities, including do you some get of those protested? universities. Mm -hmm. do you, have you been protested actively? Oh, no, that's uh, protesting. I just uh, gave a talk at a Florida university, and I had, they had to have several dozen policemen escort me in and out of campus, including an armored personnel carrier, <laughs> which I've Florida. never had before. That's a, that's a new that's record. Florida. Florida's actually better than most, the most okay? Yeah. I don't think I can actually go on to any other campuses. Um, no, I've been a visiting professor at Harvard, Yale, um, Georgetown. I'm a graduate of some of these universities. Um, I don't know if I could actually uh, lecture at them today. It'd be very, very difficult and probably problematic for the university itself. But I will tell you that these universities are the last place, the last place in America where you have freedom of expression. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the only place that people have freedom of expression, the issue is uh, on Israel-Palestine. All of a sudden they have freedom of expression. Um, even going to teach at some of these universities years ago, I was given lists of words and phrases I couldn't use. And, uh, and I get in trouble. And uh, so it was the last place. And I don't, I don't think I'd survive very long in these campuses today. Um, but as you said, it's a process that began in the 60s. In the 60s, the, 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 the youth radicals um, took over campuses. They tried to export their ideas outside of the campus. It didn't work so well. And so they went back into the campuses and closed the gates behind them and it devoted their energies to producing generation after generation of faculty that, um, that perpetuated these ideas and actually radicalized some of these ideas. And um, I remember meeting some... PhD candidate in, uh, in the art history department of Harvard. And I said, are you ever going to get tenure? He says, no way. I said, why not? He says, well, I'm not a Marxist. So you couldn't get tenure in the art history department of Harvard uh, unless, you're, unless you're a communist. Uh, what is that telling you? What, that, what does communism have to do with art history? So um, everything. <laughs> everything. Uh, well, this is even some years ago already. So this didn't start. This did not start yesterday. No, 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 this is no. a long process. Alan Bloom and wrote it. I actually, yeah, I remember, you know, I was influenced by Alan Bloom. I actually took him around Israel. Oh, nice. He's yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, his guide sure. around Israel. Uh, and, uh, so for the audience, The Closing of the American Mind is one of the most important books written, I think, in 80? 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, yeah, yeah. 87, 88, The Closing of the American Mind by Alan Bloom, a, along with Saul Bellow, the Committee on Social Thought, a incredibly prophetic professor about where academia and the ivory tower were going. He saw it back in the 80s, and I, you know, I'd come out of these universities, and I saw it already. And, um, and it was clear that, that, that it was a very smart move on the part of the revolution because they understood that when people came out of these universities, they would go into uh, key positions in government and in finance and elsewhere. And um, you know, among my friends, we refer to it as the posthumous victory of the Soviet Union. It's precisely what the Soviet Union wanted to do. It didn't live to see its success, <laughs> but it is, it's, it's an extraordinary success. Um, uh, in my own field, uh, which is Middle Eastern history, um, there was uh, the book Orientalism by Edward Said, the Columbia professor, which is probably the most influential book in the humanities of the past 30, 40 years. It was published in the late 70s. And um, I would encounter students who, who had read Orientalism from various courses, Italian history, uh, French literature. You, 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 you could go through four years of an Ivy League school and read Orientalism several times. And what is interesting about it is not only that it's, as history, it's bunk, because the thesis of Orientalism is that the study of the Middle East in the West was designed to reduce the Middle East to a subject and then conquer it for imperialism. But it's bunk because the greatest Orientalists were the Germans and the Hungarians who never coveted a piece of the Middle East. There's no 
German or Hungarian uh, colonies in the Middle East. But what Edward Said did was to plant what I call the sequoia of self-doubt in the innermost courtyard of academia. And he took what I regard as the, certainly the, the strongest characteristic of Western civilization, certainly Western inquiry, is to be curious about other cultures. Amazing, because you don't really find that in the world. I don't think you find that in many Asian cultures, certainly not in Middle Eastern cultures. You know, you're not gonna find in, in Middle East universities, okay? Al-Azhar University in Cairo, you're not gonna find a Department of American Studies or American Literature, okay? So we had this, this deep in the West, a deep uh, curiosity about Middle East cultures, and what Edward Said was to turn it from something positive to something absolutely evil, and turn it into self-hatred. And at the, base of, at the base of Orientalism and its approach is a deep self-doubt and self-hatred. And that's what you see played out in foreign policy today. Yeah. Well, let's talk for a second on foreign policy and a body that is so uh, sacrosanct in foreign policy that I'm sure you have some opinions on the United Nations mm. and their role, you know, coming out of World War I in the League of Nations, uh, then turning in, in the 40s into the United Nations and the arbiter and adjudicator of disputes. You know, it was uh, uh, from the Congress of Vienna to the 1940s and the United Nations. And now the United Nations role having dictatorial regimes, having an equal vote or even a heavier vote on right. certain you know, human uh -huh. rights councils, security committees, uh, and now their relationship so antipathetically, so uh, diametrically opposed to all things Israel. They see nothing wrong in Sudan, nothing wrong in Rwanda, nothing wrong everywhere else, but in Israel is their focus. Why is that and what is going to be the, the move going forward? Again, this is not new. Uh, my first diplomatic role was as an advisor to Israel's uh, delegation to the UN um, a long time ago. and. Uh, more than 40 years ago, and uh, I would go to represent Israel in various committees, and, and there'd be people in three-piece suits getting up there and spouting anti-Semitism. I never forget listening to an Arab representative actually getting up in, on the podium and questioning whether Jews are human beings, whether we belong to the human race. Uh, you know, it was, it, this, on the this Human was, Rights was, Committee? This was probably. And um, so I have, I have a sort of a ambivalent relationship with the UN, and maybe that's an understatement. Uh, on one hand, you know, we owe a certain amount of our existence to the UN because of the partition resolution of 1947. And we shouldn't necessarily, you know, cancel our, reservation, our, our membership of the UN and walk out. On the other hand, I cannot for the life of me, Matt, understand why the city of New York, home to one of the largest and most vibrant Jewish communities, allows the UN to be headquartered there. Uh, this is an anti-Semitic organization, an anti-Semitic organization almost on a daily basis. And uh, New York doesn't need the UN. It's a pain to New Yorkers. They hate it. Oh, yeah. They close the streets, right? I live on the east side. Think, just think how yeah. beautiful, what a park that would be along the East River. Just really, really gorgeous. Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza. Well, yeah. really, it'd be great. Let the UN move to, I think, a more appropriate city like Tehran, yeah. uh, Damascus. I think, I think they'd love to have it's it. It's other cities, Geneva, and you know, we know how the Swiss have uh, viewed their role in relations, which is, we'll bank the money. We'll work with whatever regime wants to domicile mm. their capital. With but I, I really don't, I don't understand, I don't understand its presence in New York. Do you think Isra uh, Israel should maintain its position or sort of recede from it because its entire raison d'etre now is rolling over Israel? No, no, it's the entire raison d'etre, but it's a lot of it. it, it now it it's is, a this lot last of it. year Israel or Israel gets condemned more frequently than any other uh, country uh, in the world, sometimes more than all of the countries in the world combined, especially if you go into the Human Rights Commission. Uh, we're the only country in the world that is a subject of, of one article, Article 7, of the UN Human Rights Charter, which calls for the UN to investigate Israel for human rights violations every year. Right, again, not North Korea, not Sudan, not any of these countries, uh, just Israel. Uh, and that's extraordinary. And that, that is, by definition, singling out Israel for uh, condemnation is, is, by definition, anti-Semitism. So, um, you know, I think it, it's an open question whether should, we should remain members of that organization, but I do think it's inappropriate for the United States and certainly the city of New York to host an abjectly anti-Semitic organization. Well, you're not gonna get an argument from me there. You, uh, the European Union, uh, historically the last, you know, especially the last 10, 15 years, the votes of countries like France, like Germany, even the UK at times, uh, certainly Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, have usually went toward the left and in line with the United Nations on condemnation. Brussels and Strasbourg mimicked the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Then you had Central European countries like Poland and Hungary, Czechia, Slovakia, that especially owing to their history with Jewish populations that have been there for so many centuries, uh, 
they were more either abstaining or sometimes voting to defend Israel. There's been a little bit of a shift actually post October 7th. How do you how do you read that? Well, the shifting well before that. It, it's not necessarily about Israel. It's about uh, the rightward shift in the EU, EU and in Europe. And uh, among the EU, they have to reach a consensus. 28 states have to vote the same way. Uh, and in condemn, condemn, condemning Israel, you're going to have time, hard time today getting that consensus. You could 10, 15 years ago. Very difficult today. Uh, which, by the way, presents Israel with certain challenges. Uh, I personally don't want people to love us because they hate Muslims. And there's some radical right-wing uh, uh, sure. parties in Europe that have an anti-Semitic past, a fascist past. We, we are the Jewish democratic state, and we have to maintain our character in that way. But I think that the EU is far less problematic than it used to be. Um, the foreign minister of the EU is, remains quite problematic. He's talked this week uh, just about imposing a Palestinian state on us. I think we should turn around and let them say that we should impose a Palestinian state on, on Brussels yeah. and see how well, they deal with it. They <laughs> sort of have one. I mean, if you've been to uh, Molenbeek and most of Brussels and Antwerp have been Islamicized at higher urban rates so than most So let them break off and let them have their own state and see what happens. So uh, it, was, it, it, it is the height of hubris and, and terribly, terribly uh, condescending. Uh, they have their us. own internal realpolitik they have to deal with, especially in a country sure. like Germany with massive Turkish migration internally for, for jobs. And now they're a huge voting bloc. We see that in the UK as well. You see it in the UK, you see it in France, you see it in all different places. But, but Germany sure. and Hungary recently yeah. offered yeah. hostages that are held in Gaza honor or citizenship so that they could come under some sort of symbolic and maybe more aegis of protection. One of the great so, joys I had um, as being the, the deputy minister in the prime minister's office for diplomacy um, was meeting with uh, officials in Europe who um, were sponsoring the labeling initiative. Where they were labeled is Jewish products from Judea and Samaria and, um, and just confronting them with their anti-Semitism. That you know, how do you, that laboring Jewish products is how fascism, Nazism, Vichy France is what they did, and you know, Jewish and businesses confronting, in Germany. confronting them with the laboring policy and confronting them with their anti-Semitism. It was it was extraordinary. I enjoyed it immensely, um, and they were you know shocked shocked that they were being called anti-Semites. Um, I had no problem doing that. There was a uh, vote uh, within Brussels, Strasbourg, recently, I think two weeks ago, to at least symbolically align with Israel to confront terrorism, should be a 100% issue, nobody should have an issue with it. And it was Pedro Sanchez in Spain yeah. who vetoed it. And this is a, 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 an out, outward Marxist Communist Party, uh, new renewed head of state uh, with some uh, dicey ways of the way he built the coalition. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, still a Marxism issue in Europe that aligns with the anti-Semitic in South, South America. You know, you have Colombia, you have uh, Brazil, Cuba, of course, Venezuela. All these countries. If the, if you are a socialist, communist, you're anti-America. You're anti. You're anti. Oh, yeah. They go totally hand in hand. The Forum Sao Paulo, which was based, uh, it was the Soviet Union's uh, a te post-Soviet Union attempt with from Lula da Silva, who's now president again of Brazil, and uh, Fidel Castro, yeah. and they were very successful in Latin America, taking over even in countries like Chile and Colombia, which were relatively more conservative. But now we have a, a weird pendulum shift in Argentina. Yeah, it's and, weird. <laughs> and, and I, was, I was at Malay's inauguration a few oh, weeks really? ago, That's and yeah. his support is incredible. And this is an outward, not just philo-Semitic. He wants to convert to Judaism. He does Torah study. Uh, he's a fa and uh, in Buenos Aires, there's tons of synagogues yeah, yeah. and vibrant Jewish community. Uh, is there any been any outreach directly with Malay? And I, I don't know. I hope so. I hope so. And uh, this is a very vibrant Jewish community in Argentina. Yeah, so much so that Iran bombed a community center uh, Indeed. in the 90s, and then uh, the uh, the prosecutor uh, was assassinated. Uh, so, I mean, it's certainly no, I think you know Ed Fulner as well. He always says uh, no permanent victories and no permanent defeats, but certainly we have to have a permanent victory with Hamas uh, to stabilize the world. Certainly. And to, to if you care about peace, there's no chance for peace ever. Okay, and I'm not a big you know, advocate of the two-state solution. I just don't, I don't think it's a solution, um, but... Any chance of advancing to any point with the Palestinians will be impossible as long as Hamas is a power. I saw a great tweet that we're in favor of the 23-state solution, 22 Arab states and one Jewish state. <laughs> and actually, it's a map, and, and we've all seen the map. Uh, what about Hezbollah and that front? Well, I'll put my cards on the table. In the first week of the war, I published an article in the Hebrew press. I write for the Hebrew press as well, and um, uh, advocating... A, a policy in which we freeze the situation in Gaza because Hamas wasn't going anywhere. We keep hitting Hamas for the air, ground, sea, keep up the pressure to release the hostages, but then we focus the brunt and the bulk of our military might against Hezbollah. And the, the, the opportunity was really quite unique because we had 360,000 reservists called up. We had two American carrier strike groups off the coast of Lebanon. 
Uh, and we had a lot of international support earlier in, in October, as you know, um, which is largely dissipated, but back then it was very strong. Um, and I stress that, that while Hamas poses a tactical threat to the state of Israel, Hezbollah poses a strategic threat to Hezbollah, to Israel. It's roughly 15 times the threat of Hamas. It's 150,000 rockets, which are bigger, longer range, more accurate, some of them quite accurate. It's a terrorist force of 100,000 gunmen who have spent the previous decade massacring Syrians, so they're very adept at massacring civilians, and they're right over the border, and that's an impossible situation for any sovereign country. They're not a ragtag bunch. They're military. Oh, no. They're, they're no, no. formal military yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of Lebanon, now, with Iranian support, of course. Yeah. I'd be remiss, you know, Central European outlet, uh, we covered Ukraine very, very, very tightly. Uh, you know, really, Poland is existential, and Central Europe is existential. Uh, where's Russia in this? Obviously, we know that they are allied with Iran, but what role do you think they might have had? What mode? We don't know yet. We don't know that. We know that uh, on October 7th, a great number of Russian bots were put out into the internet and that were seen to be a comparative advance. We don't know yet. Um, Russia had been a, a frenemy country. Uh, on one hand, you know, they have been supporting our, our worst enemies, whether it be Iran, Hezbollah, certainly Syria. Um, on the other hand, we had a decent relationship with Putin. We had uh, a tremendous amount of trade. And we have a, a very large Russian diaspora here. Between one out of uh, seven and one out of every five Israelis speak Russian. I've heard it on the streets. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So Russian's very big. I interview the Russian press here often. So a lot of, a lot of connections. Um, and that, I think, has come to a real end on October 7th. Um, I personally was very opposed to my own government's policy on Ukraine. I thought that as the Jewish and democratic state, we had to stand by Ukraine. And Israel had declared neutrality. I, I had problems with that. Um, I had a problem with the fact that we were broadcasting fear of the Russian army in Syria, which is all of between four, that time was only four, was 4,000 people, now it's 1,000. Um, and uh, broadcasting fear to the entire region that the IDF is afraid of Russian. And, um, you know, we, the payback we got was now Russia fully behind um, Hamas, fully behind Iran, um, and buying thousands of, of Iranian missiles and, and drones to use to kill, to, to kill Europeans. And uh, uh, I think we should be strongly identified with the West. And there it is not so much a friend of a country anymore. It's more like an enemy. Yeah. There was a re realpolitik detente because of the diaspora, because right. of the connection. There's still a, a large Jewish rooted population, all of Indeed. Central and Eastern mm -hmm. Europe. Uh, but Russia certainly had a motive to get America involved in this proxy battle to keep them away from renewed funding and renewed attention in Ukraine. Uh, so I think their cyber capabilities, like you said, in social media, for instance, uh, probably pl played some sort of mm. direct role. That's interesting, Matt. You know, I wrote this book about the Six Day War and uh, Six Days of War now, available at famously reduced prices. But uh, and one of the theories about the outbreak of the Six Day War was that um, Nasser's aggression to Israel was precipitated by the Russians, by the Soviets, to divert attention from America's bombing of North Vietnam. Yeah. Well, Russia always plays a, a three and four D chess. That's their strength. Where mm -hmm. they, they they may not have the uh, the the top weaponry, but they certainly play some uh, interesting proxy games. Mm -hmm. So one one final question. Uh, you've had some well uh, well known, well telegraphed experience in Lebanon in the uh, in the crazy times of the eighties. Is there anything well into the nineties? And well into the yeah. can you talk about it and what parallels we can draw from it in the current uh, current destabilizing battles? It's this. Sometimes we forget where we are. I don't know whether we think we're in Long Island um, or in the Hamptons. I, I think that um, we forget that we're in the Middle East. And what occurred on October 7th was horrific, terrible, shocking, but not at all out of character with the Middle East. What Hamas did to Israelis on that day, Arabs are doing to one another from, I don't know if time immemorial, but certainly in modern period. And I saw evidences of massacres and war crimes in, in Lebanon that Arabs had done to Arabs, which is really no different. And it's, it's simply what happened in, in Syria, what happened in, in sovereign Shatila, but also in Damour, where the Palestinians massacred the Syrians. Very, very similar. And we forget where we are. We were under the, con under the belief that we could pay them off, that they could change their DNA through money, through Qatari money, 
um, because we thought, oh, they want the same things we do. They want good schools and good hospitals and future for their, for their children. No, they are profoundly, inherently different. You know, this Western notion that everyone basically the same, everyone wants basically the same thing. Culture matters. Yeah, it's just it's extremely, extremely different and, um, and very, very dangerously different. It just is. So I learned that. I learned that, um, for example, um, Israel's withdrawal from Lebanon uh, in May 2000, not only did it send a message of weakness that helped precipitate the outbreak of the Second Intifada um, that October, but it also created a situation where Hezbollah was able to move into southern Lebanon. And um, we were losing between 20 and 25 soldiers a year holding on to the security zone in southern Lebanon, which at the time seemed a prohibitive cost. In retrospect, by withdrawing from that security zone, we may have jeopardized the lives of millions, millions. Um, right now, we used to have two security zones, one on the north and one on the south in Gaza. Now we still have two security zones, but they're on our side of the border. That's an intolerable situation for Israel. We can't allow ourselves to shrink in that way. Cannot. Because the other side is going to come in and say they got us on the run. We have to restore those security zones. Uh, it's a matter of national survival. It's not even a matter of volition. And yes, the world is going to condemn us. And yes, there's going to be extreme tensions and maybe even breakdown in relations with uh, the United States. But at the end of the day, we have no choice, Matt. And if we have to throw rocks at these people, we will. So Francis Fukuyama, when he wrote The End of History, was not correct. History is not over. And we are fighting battles that we've been fighting across culture, across right. geography existential battles for a thousand years, and sadly, they'll probably persist. One final short question. Qatar, U.S. presence in Qatar, economic relations with Qatar, Al Jazeera. I mean, we see, we were in Ramallah, and what, you know, we're here, we have debates between Fox News and Israel and MSNBC or whatever. There it's Al Jazeera, and they're spouting a line that uh, those sympathizers of Hamas embrace. Mm -hmm. what, what's your relations with Qatar look like? Listen, right now, we kind of need them. As, a, as an intermediaries with uh, Hamas trying to get some hostages back. But at the end of this war, there has to be a reckoning, a serious reckoning by not just Israel and the United States and the West. No more American bases, no more branches of American universities, no more investment. Okay. Hamas, uh, Qatar is a, is a world leader in sponsoring terror and has been instrumental in uh, precipitating this crisis, which has cost many, many thousands of lives. And threatens to take many thousands more and spin out of control. So Qatar is at the center of this, and it has to be held, taken to task for it in the post-war period. Thank you so much for your time. This Good is you, really fascinating, yeah. really amazing, amazing insights.